Journey to the Center of the Word with your host, Michael Rood. Leave your inherited traditions behind and venture back in time with us as we explore the scriptures in the original context of the land, culture, and language of ancient Israel. This is the paradigm shift for which you've been waiting an entire lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Rood. Welcome to The Judges. The King is coming. This episode, Keep Yourself from the Accursed Thing. As we are on our way to the book of Judges, we have to understand, first of all, that there has to be a standard by which one is judged. And uh, a person's character is a, uh, the test that's applied to a person that shows their moral fabric and what they are really made of. And we are going to see the character, not only of the land of Israel, but the character that is being called upon with each individual within the nation. Because it's the individuals within the nation that makes up the entire nation. And we are going to see the character that develops when there is a king, the king from heaven who rules over his kingdom. But when the king is not personally present, we then see that people do whatever is right in their own eyes. And the book of the Judges is really the synthesis of a prophetic shadow picture of where we are right now at this day and time. Because we do have the king. The king from heaven was here. He laid down the rules of the kingdom of heaven. He laid down the, uh, the, the protocols and the parameters whereby one is either admitted into the eternal kingdom or excluded from the eternal kingdom. But very few people listen to what the king, what Yeshua said. Very, very few people do it. They don't treat it with, with any amount of seriousness whatsoever, and that's why Yeshua himself said that in the Greek, most of those who say that Jesus is Lord and call him Lord, who cast out demons, who do wonderful works in his name, most of those who come before him on Judgment Day purporting that they are followers of the true Messiah are going to be told to depart. I never, ever knew you. So what we're going to do is go step back now into the beginning of the book of Joshua. We finished up with Deuteronomy. We saw as Moses laid down the standard whereby the nation of Israel, the individuals, are to govern themselves according to the commandments of the Almighty. And now it is Joshua, whose name means the Savior, who is actually going to lead them into the promised land uh, because Moses were, was forbidden from going because he destroyed the prophetic shadow picture of the Messiah as the rock who was to be smitten once and afterward to be declared, but he struck the rock twice, destroying the prophetic shadow picture. So now we're gonna go back to uh, Joshua 1.1 and read just a couple of verses here to capture the context. Joshua 1.1, now after the death of Moses, a servant, the, the servant of Yehovah, came to pass that Yehovah spake unto Yahushua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, rise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, which is all the way over into Iraq today all the land of the Hittites, and under the great sea toward the going down of the sun, the sea on the west, which is the Mediterranean, and that is going to be your coast, the borders from the Euphrates all the way to the Mediterranean. There shall not be any man that's going to be able to stand before you all the days of your life, Yehoshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you, nor will I forsake you. 
Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land. And this is the overview of the entire book of Judges, because we are going to go in and take part of the land, and even the land that we do not secure, we are going to then divide it up, and it's going to be divided up by lots. The very first incident that we, we get into is a reminder uh, for the family of Reuben, which from the family of Reuben, the oldest is Hanuk, and his people and offspring are called the Hanukites, the dedicated ones. And so it is Reuben, uh, the tribe of God, God or Gad, and a half tribe of Manasseh that are given the property, of their inheritance over on the other side of the Yarden, the Jordan River, uh, toward the rising of the sun, the east side of the Jordan River, but they are told they can leave their, their young ones and their wives behind, but you must go in and you must fight and secure the land that is for your brethren, because they fought with you, you fought with them, and if you don't go over, be sure your sin will find you out. And right here in the very first chapter of Joshua, that is when Joshua then tells them, again, you have to go over, and they said that if any one of us doesn't go, we'll kill them ourselves, because that's how serious it was taken. Now, Joshua chapter two, verse one, uh, this is a setup for going into the promised land, going over the Jordan River. And Yehoshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim, and again, in order to find out where Shittim is, you simply um, uh, go up uh, Shittim Creek, and, uh, and you don't even need a paddle when you get there, and there you will find Shittim. But uh, that's was where they were camping in Shittim, and they sent out two men to spy secretly. Uh, we don't have their names here, but I understand it was David McCallum and Robert Vaughn who were first spies that were sent secretly. And he told them to go view the land, even Jericho. And when we see the word even, uh, you can put the word equals because you know in mathematics that's what we use. Uh, equals means even, and it is one uh, one and the same. They went in to view the land, specifically Jericho, and they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab, and they lodged there, literally they lied there. Uh, they came into a harlot's house. Now, Zanah, which is in Hebrew, it's used nearly 80 times, and every time it is a harlot, a whore, or a prostitute. This, these are the words that are used to translate it. And uh, as I had mentioned, uh, later Bible translations have tried to turn her into an innkeeper, but uh, in every instance in the scripture, it is a paid professional woman. This is like a Bell Watlin's house in Atlanta, gone with the wind. You remember Bell Watlin? And, uh, uh, and so uh, there, the spies go in and they're going undercover. They are undercover, literally undercover. So they go into the house of a prostitute a house of ill repute, uh, as it would be, uh, as became known in, in uh, the United States of America in the Old West. But see, this is a perfect place for spies to go in because they would be beyond suspicion. They just wouldn't raise uh, too much of a question for out-of-towners to come into the city of Jericho and to go to a, a brothel. And so this is exactly where they went. And in verse two, it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, there came two men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab saying, bring forth the men that have come to you, which are entered into your house, for they have come to search out the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said this. There came two men to me, but I did not know where, where they came from. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. And where they went, I have no idea. Pursue after them quickly, for certainly you shall overtake them. But she had brought them 
up to the roof of the house, hid them in the stalks of flax, which he had laid in order up on the roof. Oh, there, that's how uh, you dry out flax, you lay them out on the roof, and so she hid them under the flax. Now this is not gonna be a comfortable place for them, but it was certainly going to be a secure place because they could stack flax upon flax upon flax. And then it says that the men pursued after them uh, all the way to the, the fords of the, the Jordan. And as soon as they pursued after them and, and they were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they, these two spies were laid down, she came to them on the roof and she said to them, listen to this, I know that Yahovah hath given you the land and that your terror has fallen upon all of us and the inhabitants of the entire land are, are fainting because of you. For we have heard how that Yehovah dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. See, this is no secret, ladies and gentlemen, still not a secret today except to modern uh, religionists who want to make it all fairy tale. They heard about it, they knew about it, and she is telling them exactly what they heard up there in Jericho. And, uh, and also we've heard what he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan. Uh, uh, Sihon and Og, uh, you remember, long neck and uh, uh, warrior, warrior and log neck, the, the giant, who you utterly destroyed, we heard all about that. And as soon as we heard those things, our heart melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. Because Yehovah, your Elohim, he's the God of heaven above and of the earth beneath. So th this is why I'm asking you, swear unto me by the name of, Yo of Yehovah, since I've shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token that you will save me alive, my father, my mother, my brother, and my sister, and all that we have, and that you will deliver our lives from the death. And so the men said, our life for yours. If you do not utter a single word of this business, it shall be that when Yahweh gives us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall and she dwelt right there upon the wall. Now, they, they say that the walls of Jericho were so thick that you could race chariots, two abreast chariots upon the top of the wall, a huge wall, and so any wall that thick is going to be extremely high, so you know, letting them down, they're literally repelling down the wall, and she had the wherewithal, she secured the wherewithal to where she could put them down on a rope out of her window, which is right on the wall, and uh, to let her all the way down. Now, I suppose that you know that was also kind of like a billboard for her profession uh, right there, because they they had her house right on the wall of the of the town, and uh, and she she told them to go to the mountains, and uh, be, because uh, the the pursuers you you want to get out of the way, so hide yourself for three days until the pursuers return, and afterward then go your way. And so the men said unto her in, uh, in, in verse 17, we will be blameless of this oath which you have made us swear. Behold, when we come to the land, you shall bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which you did let us down by. And so now we find out that the rope was really scarlet. It was a red or a scarlet rope that she let down. Maybe that's where the red light or red rope district uh, came into usage uh, on, uh, uh, because of this term. And so uh, it says, when we come in, when we see that scarlet rope hanging out of your window, the same one that you let us in by, uh, let us down by, when we see that, everyone will be made aware that this place no one is to touch, but everyone stays inside. Nobody goes outside of this house because if you go outside, we can't be responsible for you. And so they swore to her.
The bills were adding up. I was at the end of my rope and wasn't sure what to do. Then I stopped to watch my daughter. How could she be so calm when I was so stressed? And then it hit me. As her mother, she had faith in me to provide for her. She never doubted. She just did her thing, trusting that mom would make everything okay. It's exactly what I wasn't doing. I needed to trust that my father in heaven would make everything okay. Sometimes all it takes is faith the size of a mustard seed to change your world. Right now, with your gift of any amount to A Root Awakening International, we'll send you the Faith of a Mustard Seed Pendant Necklace, a reminder that your Father in Heaven has everything under control. Call today or visit our website to make your donation and receive the Faith of a Mustard Seed Pendant Necklace. Now, we go to Joshua chapter three, verse one. He rose up early in the morning, they, they moved from Shittim, came to the Jordan, all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. They passed over or crossed over, which is again, Abarim, Abar, uh, 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 Abaru, Abaru, which Hebrew, which means to cross over or to pass over. And verse three, and uh, they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah, then you shall move and go after it, but you're to follow it by the space of about 2,000 cubits. The reason being is it's out there that far, everyone is going to see, that's where the Ark is, and everyone is going to be able to follow the Ark if you keep that much distance uh, right there. And so now we're going to go down to verse 12. Now therefore, take 12 men out of the tribes of every tribe of man. It shall come to pass as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of Yehovah shall rest in the waters, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and it shall stand up in a heap. In verse 16, and so the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam. And there's a, now there's a bridge, the Adam Bridge, uh, which is a little bit on the south side of, uh, of um, uh, Beit Shan, uh, uh, quite a ways south of Beit Shan. And, and so the, the water stood up in a heap uh, very far from, the, from uh, Beit Shan, uh, which is beside Zeratan, and those that came down toward the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, again, which is the Sea of the Plain is equal to the Salt Sea. So whenever you see the term, the Sea of the Plain, it's not referring to the Galilee, it's referring to the Dead Sea. And so the waters were cut off, the people passed over, and then in chapter four, it goes on to tell us that Moses instructs these 12 men, one from each tribe, to take some stones from the middle of the Jordan River. And they, these stones are to be erected as a memorial. But what is going to transpire when the priest feet touch the Jordan River, then the water stand up in a heap and the people were going to cross over on dry ground and the men who are carrying the ark will stand in the middle of the Jordan River till everyone passes over. Then these men who have already crossed over are then going to go back and get some stones and set them up as an altar of witness. Now, this is very important to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that there is an altar of witness and there's an altar of sacrifice. It speaks of this in the last days that there is going to be an altar in the midst of the land of Egypt and at the border there, border thereof. And of course, uh, you know, the great pyramid of Giza itself sits in the midst of the land of Egypt and also at the border of between North and South Egypt. There's also an altar or a pillar of witness which stands at the shore of the Yom Suv, uh, at, uh, at, at Nueva, Egypt, and that is what was erected by Solomon. Solomon put up a, a pillar on each side of the crossing site, 
and uh, the, the one that was found over on the Arabian shore was still standing, it was still intact, it was still standing, and on it could be made out the inscription uh, of the name yod heh vav which and it was all in Paleo-Hebrew, and it was a, uh, and also Pharaoh and death in Egypt, and from that they could determine that this was something that Solomon put up as a pillar of witness on each side of the crossing site of the Red Sea on dry ground. Uh, the one that was found over in Nueva, Egypt, that is now, uh, has been picked up, it was found in the water, uh, it was a wash in the water, it was actually Ron Wyatt uh, that found this pillar uh, while I Israel controlled that part of Egypt after the, uh, uh, after the war with Egypt. And uh, they, the Israeli engineers picked it up, put it in concrete, and is still standing. And that is also at the border. So when we see the word altar, you have to designate whether it's an altar of witness or an altar of sacrifice. And this becomes very important when we get into a little bit later into the book of Judges. Uh, so they are to pick up these stones and build an altar of witness to remember that day so that whenever their offspring, their children, great-grandchildren come to this place, they ask, what is this? And we say, this is where we cross the Jordan River on dry ground when we came in to take the land that was promised to our forefathers. And, um, and as it says in verse seven, these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And then we go to verse nine. And so Joshua set up the 12 stones, set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan, the place where the feet of the priest, which bear the ark stood, and there they are to this day. And so uh, the priests uh, bear the ark, uh, they, they stood in the midst of Jordan until everyone had gone all the way through. And now we come in verse 19. The people came out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal. Now, what's the 10th day of the first month? It is the day that the Passover lamb is to be selected. This is the significance of this particular day. And uh, then in verse 21, and he spoke to the children of Israel and said, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over the Jordan on dry ground, for Yahovah your Elohim dried up the waters of Jordan before you until you passed over just as he did the Reed Sea or the Yam Suf, which he dried up before us until we were all gone over. That all the people of the earth might know that the hand of Yehovah, that he is the one who is mighty and that you might fear, respect Yehovah forever. And so after crossing over, now we are in the, the face of the battle for Jericho. The first major battle to take the land which is across the Jordan River. And in verse two of chapter five, we read, at that time, at that time, Yahovah said unto Joshua, make sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives. And then it goes on to say that, uh, uh, that Joshua circumcised all the people, all that came out of Egypt, because the entire time that we were in the wilderness, we never circumcised our children. And we cannot participate in the Passover unless our children are circumcised. And so, and this is why Joshua circumcised them. And so all the children that, uh, all the males that came out of Egypt, all the men of war, they died in the wilderness. And all that, came out and were born out in the wilderness, none of them were circumcised, and that's why it had to be done at that particular time. And verse eight, and it came to pass when he had done, finished circumcising all the people, that they abode in their, the places of the camp until they were whole. 
and um, and th- this is why they, they called this the uh, Gilgal of the, ho- the Hill of the Foreskins, because they took all the foreskins from the circumcision and piled them all up together. That must have been odoriferous out there in the heat of the desert. And then we, we encamped in Gilgal in verse 10, and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, even on the plains of Jericho. And so we came over on the 10th, we circumcised the children, and then on the 14th, uh, because all of the nation was circumcised, including the hewers of wood and the drawers of water, the, all the Gentiles that joined themselves to us, all the Egyptians that joined themselves to Israel. It was a mixed multitude coming out of Egypt, and now the entire multitude, everyone is circumcised at that place. And it says on in verse 11, and they did eat of the old corn, it says in King James, but that's not really accurate. They did not eat of the old corn or the the old barley, it was they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched in the self same day. Now here the word parched is in reference to barley, because barley is harvested in the stage of Aviv and then it is parched and then presented in the temple or tabernacle in this case, it is presented uh, on the day of uh, uh, the, the bickering, the first fruit offering, Yoma bickering, that is when it is offered and then we can eat of the barley at that time. So this lets us know that uh, again, what we did is that uh, let's let's see where we're going to see this right here. They kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. So what is the 14th day at even? That's when the Passover sacrifice, but then we eat the Passover lamb on the 15th. After the sun is set, it is now the 15th. And so that's the high day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After the Passover is eaten, the 15th day, uh, then at the end of that day, that would have had to have been on a Sabbath. The 15th would have had to have been on a weekly Sabbath because now when the sun sets, it's Yom HaBikarim. And it tells us that this is when we take the barley, the Aviv barley, we, par- we harvest it, and this is how it was done in the temple, after the sun set on the weekly Sabbath, we harvested it, then we parched it in fire, we ground it, baked it, and then it was presented in the tabernacle or in the temple on the day after the weekly Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this particular year, the fifth, uh, the uh, Friday, Good Friday, <laughs> Friday was when the Passover lamb was actually sacrificed on the 14th, it was eaten on the 15th, and at the end of the day, that was when it would have been uh, the Yom Bikarim, the barley was harvested, it was then parched, and then we ate parched the day after Passover. And then it tells us that we had manna no more. Up until that day, we had manna, and it came down every day except for the Sabbath. And so there, we did eat of the fruit of the land of Passover that particular year. Now, we did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan. And now, talking about the land of Canaan, now we've passed over to where Canaan squatted. The offspring of Canaan came after the Confucian languages. It is Canaan, that cursed family. The sexual perversion of Canaan followed them. They came into the land, and finally, the sin of the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Jebusites finally came to the full and the Almighty sent his people in to take this land from them that they were squatting on and to cleanse the land and get rid of all the paganism, get rid of all the sexual perversion and to live according to the commandments of the Almighty. We are now going to enter into the land of Canaan, and when we enter into the land of Canaan, we are going to see how 
being obedient to the commandments is what's going to keep us free from bondage, but when we then compromise and go with the sexual perversion and going with the way of the, the sinners, the way of the Canaanites, the way of the world, with all of their pagan sun worship, that is what's going to bring us into bondage. We're gonna take a break right here before we get into the angel incident, which is very important to understand the book of the Judges and what transpires. Joshua was near Jericho when he saw a man off in the distance, and he, he saw that he had his sword drawn in his hand. And so Joshua went up to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? Whose side are you on? And he said, no. <laughs> Neither one, but as the captain of the host, which is army, the captain of the army of Yehovah, that is why I have come. And Yehoshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped him and said, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of Yehovah's army said to him, loose the shoe from off your foot because the place that you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was instructed because now the angel, this is an angel. This is a messenger of the Most High who's going to speak to him in the first person. He is going to be, he is the representative. We see that over and over the angel speaks in the first person for the Almighty because he's been sent to deliver a message verbatim. And this is what is the, the very essence of, uh, of an apostle, of an ambassador, of an angel. They are to deliver a message verbatim. And it is just as if the Almighty is speaking, that is how the angel speaks. And that is exactly how an ambassador is supposed to speak, because it says we are ambassadors for Messiah, and we are supposed to speak for him, and we are supposed to be speaking as if it is the first person, because this is the Messiah in us who has a message to communicate to the people. Now, to understand the place of this, I want you to go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23, and in verse 20 we read, Behold, I will send an angel before you to keep you in the way, to bring you into the place which I prepared. Beware of him, be wary of him. Obey his voice. Do not provoke him, because he is not going to pardon your transgression, your transgressions, your sin. He's not going to let you off easy because my name is in him. My nature is in him. He fully represents me. And so you don't trifle with him. 
this angel that I'm gonna send before you, you listen to him like you listen right from the mountain, the voice of the Almighty shaking the mountain, because if you transgress what he tells you to do, it's over with, because this is my voice. And then verse 22, but if you shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. My angel will go before you and he's gonna bring you unto the Amorites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You, in verse 24, it continues on, you shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do after their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them. You shall quite break down their images, and you shall alone serve Yahovah your Elohim. And he will bless your bread and your water and take all the sickness away from the midst of you. There shall nothing cast their young nor be barren in all of your land, and the number of your days will I fulfill. And then, in verse 27, I will send my fear before you and will destroy all the people to whom you shall come. I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets before you and they will drive out all these nations. I will not drive them out from before you in one year. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, here is the prophecy that we are living in today. I will not drive them out from before you in one year lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you are increased and inherit the land. And what is the land? Your bounds have I set from the Yom Suf, the Red Sea, even under the Sea of the, of the Philistines, and from the, uh, uh, which is the, the Sea of the Philistines, the Philistines are camped in the Gaza Strip and what is to their west, it's the Mediterranean Sea. And from the desert unto the river. And what is that river? It's the river Euphrates. All the way into half of the land of what is nowadays modern Iraq. That belongs to Israel, it doesn't belong to them. There's no such nation as Jordan. All these things were just desert tribes until the British got involved and started doing things completely against the scriptures. Yeah, well, it's common for them. And then it says, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you will drive them out before you. You'll make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land unless they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it's going to be a snare unto you. And we see this very thing because when we came over and came out of Egypt, we brought the cow and bull gods of Aphis and Hathor. And we see that exactly what transpired, and this is all to do with this angel again, in Exodus chapter 20, or excuse me, uh, 32, Exodus 32, and in verse 34, this is after the golden calf incident. This is Almighty. Moses, go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And, and Yehovah plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Now, we go to uh, chapter 33, right here, the next page. In Yehovah, said unto Moses, listen carefully, depart and go up thence, you and this people, which you have brought out of the land of Egypt and take them unto the land that I swore unto Abraham, to Isaac and Yaakov, saying, unto your seed will I give it. I will send my angel, an angel before you. And I'll drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hivite, etc., etc. and I'm gonna take you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, for I, I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are a stiff-necked people. And if well, the day that I visit you, I'm gonna visit your iniquity upon you. I'm going to send an angel in my place to lead the way, but you had better listen to him. But I'm not gonna go up with you because I cannot stand these people and I will not put up with their disobedience 
If I'm among them all the time, they are going to be consumed. I'm gonna have to kill you people. This is how exasperated he was with us. Now this is immediately after the golden calf incident. Now, when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. What is the evil tidings? That the Almighty, who is going before them in a pillar of fire at night, by a pillar of cloud in the daytime, that is absolute terror before and all around them, he is not going to go up with them. He says, this is it, I'm out of here. I'm gonna send my angel. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourn. Now we go all the way to verse 12. And Moses said unto Yahweh, see, you said unto me, bring up these people, and you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you've said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. But, you know, it's like he's saying, talk is cheap. So now I'm asking you, if I really found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you. See, this is it, this is what I was saying, that David said he made known his acts unto the children of Israel, his ways unto Moses. Moses is pleading, okay, you said that, that you know me by name, that, that, that I am before your face, that you'll always be with me, but now you tell me you're not going to go up, but you're gonna send an angel before. I need to know you, I need to know your way, I need to know you, that, that I can find grace in your sight, which is grace, which is the empowerment, the energy, the strength to do what you've asked me to do. And that this grace is going to allow me so that I might truly understand that this nation of stiff necked hard-hearted, rebellious people is indeed your people. And the Almighty said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to Moses, if my, if, uh, and, and, and Moses said unto the Almighty, if your presence does not go with me, don't, don't carry us out of here. I don't want to go. For this is how it shall be known here and now that I and your people have found grace in your sight. Is it not in that you go with us? That's how we'll know that we found grace in your sight. So shall we be separated, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. That's what makes us different is because you're with us. And then in verse 17, and Yahovah said unto Moses, I will do this one, this thing that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight, and do know you by name. And so Moses said, I beseech you. This is what I'm asking. Show me your glory. And the Almighty said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahovah before you and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. And he said to Moses, but you will not see my face, for there's no one who can really see me in all of my glory and yet live. And Yahweh said, behold, there's a place by me, stand over upon this rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand as I pass by. And then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And see, and really, so many times when we see the acts of the Almighty, because Moses saw his glory, but even Moses was not allowed to see him coming, but he saw where he'd been. And this is what Israel saw. They, they did not see him coming. They did not see what he was about to do, but they saw where he had been. And then we, we continue on, in, uh, because we're, we're back in, in Exodus, in this incident right here, where the Almighty said, I'm not going to go with you personally, 
in this flame and in this cloud, I'm gonna send my angel before you. But as proof that I really will be among you, but not in this physical manifestation, I am going to show you my glory, Moses. And just as you've asked, I'm going to show you my ways. Everyone else is gonna see what I do, but I'm gonna show you my ways. And then Yahweh said unto Moses, verse one, hew out two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these two tables the words that were in the first tables which you broke. Be ready in the morning, come up to Mount Sinai, present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with you, no man. Neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let flocks or herds feed on the mount. And so Moses hewed out two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and he went up into Mount Sinai. See, the first tables of stone represented as the commandments were written by the finger of the Almighty upon tables that he gave. Israel broke those commandments. And now Moses is told, you hew out the stone. You hold who out the tablets, because this represents the renewed covenant, where the tables of our heart are to be presented, and the Almighty will write upon the tables of our heart the same commandments. And, uh, and we see that when he is giving these instructions, he says in verse 13, you shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, you shall not worship any other god. For Yahovah, whose name, his nature is jealous, he is truly a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant, verse 15, with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call you, and you eat of his sacrifice and you shall take of their daughters to your sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and your sons go a-whoring after their gods. Now, uh, the word again, whoring, is, uh, is uh, speaking of paid prostitution, but here it is literally, it's a figure of speech which means to be unfaithful or disobedient to your husband. We're gonna see this later in the book of the Judges when a Levite, when his concubine, plays the harlot, plays the whore, and goes back and to her father's house. Now, how is it that she plays a whore by going back to her father's house? Because she is returning to her father's house against the wishes of her husband. She's not been given permission by her husband, but she is, is playing that, that someone else is her head and she's listening to someone else as her head, and so she goes back to her father's house, and so the scripture uh, refers to her as playing the harlot, playing the whore, because she's not under the covering of her husband. And here it is that Israel is the husband, uh, Israel's the wife of the Almighty, and when they go and worship other gods, they play around with these other gods and learn the way of the heathen and do the, uh, the, the festivals, the feast, and all this of the pagans. He says, I'm a jealous God. You are playing the harlot when you do that. It is an abomination to the Most High. But see, people are doing it nowadays. The entire Christian church is filled with pagan sun worship. You know, people, instead of keeping the feast of the Lord, uh, they're doing things like, you know, Valentine's Day, and yet they're calling it, you know, they'll call it 1 Corinthians 13 day, but they'll do it on the same day. No, it's whoring. It's whoring. It's playing the harlot with the world. No, you, you wanna have a 1 Corinthians 13 day, yeah, yeah, do it, say any other, you got like, you know, how many, how many other, Oh, hundreds of days do you have to choose from? But no, we wanna be just like the world. Now, let's, uh, I wanted to establish this as far as this angel. Now we're go, going to go back as far as the, uh, the incident with the angel and Joshua meets this angel that Moses is told about. Joshua is not there, he doesn't get to see the glory of the Almighty, but he gets to see the angel speaks to him 
face to face. Now, in Joshua 6, 1, now Jericho was straightly shut up because the children of Israel, none went out, none came in. And Yalva said unto him, see, I've given into your hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And you shall compass the city. And verse three, all the men of war go around the city once. This you shall do for six days. The seven priests shall bear the ark and with before uh, and go before the ark with seven trumpets of ram's horns. And so they have got the shofars and the seventh day, they're going to compass the city seven times. The priests shall blow with the trumpets and it'll come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when they hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people are to shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall ascend everyone up before him and Joshua, the son of Nun, then he called the priest and told them exactly what to do. In verse 13, we're gonna go down. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut their, their gold. Oh, excuse me, I was in the wrong page. Okay. So now, verse 11. So the ark of Yahovah come to the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and lost in the night. Rose up there early the next morning and did the same thing all the way through to the seventh day. So they're actually doing this. Uh, through the Sabbath day. This is after the feast, they're doing this all, every day, they're walking with the Ark of the Covenant around there, every day for seven days. So the Almighty, you know, obviously they're going more than a Sabbath day's journey, which is an invention of the Pharisees much later, but even with this, the Almighty says to do it, and when he says to do something, then you do it on the Sabbath. He created the Sabbath, for healing, he created the Sabbath for man so that we can enjoy and take part of this. And now, he said, in verse 16, it comes to pass on the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpet, Joshua said to the people, shout, shout, for Yahovah hath given you the city. In verse 17, the city shall be accursed. And cursed means banned or appointed, literally appointed for destruction the city shall be accursed. It and all that are in it, it's accursed and dedicated totally to Yahovah. It is banned for your use completely, banned from it. Only Rahab the harlot, she's the only one that shall live. She and all that are with her inside of her house because she hid the messengers that we sent. But you, you in any wise are to keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Keep, shomer, guard yourself from that thing which is accursed, which is appointed for destruction, lest you make yourself accursed, appointed for destruction. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it, that's when it is going to come down upon you. Now, when we talk about a point for destruction, that, that accursed thing, and to keep yourself from this, there is nothing new here, ladies and gentlemen. The entire book of Deuteronomy, we went over and over and over and over, repeated over and over in that one standing there with Moses. Just before going over, just before Moses' death and going over the river, we are told over and over to guard ourselves, have nothing to do with the pagans and the, their festivals and the things that they do to worship and to serve their gods. It reminds me of what Yeshua said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, is gonna enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. And where do you find the will of God? It's his word. Where do we find his word, his instructions on how we are to live? Right here in the Torah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians weren't even written yet. What is he talking about? 
It's right here doing the will of the Father. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeshua is. The Almighty doesn't change. His commandments don't, don't change. And if he were here among us right now, there wouldn't be any of us alive. He would completely lay waste the entire Christian world. Thankfully, we've got messengers that are holding out forth the word and holding a standard out there. Ambassadors, apostles, and angels. And they said, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In your name have we not cast out demons? In your name haven't we done wonderful works? And I will profess to them, I never knew you. Get out of my face, depart from me. You that work anomia. A in Greek is without nomia, nomos is the Torah. You who are without the instructions, those of you who exclude without exclude the instructions from the Almighty and live like however you wanna live, I'm gonna say, get out of my face. See, Yeshua knows that these things were written aforetime for our learning, that they are a warning to us, lest that after we are saved, after we are mikvahed, then in our disobedience, we are finally thrust away, I don't know you. Yeshua's warning here is serious. And he goes on to say, the seriousness of this, is to those who do not guard, do not protect, do not keep themselves, from that which is condemned, from that which is an abomination, from that which is accursed, banned, and appointed for destruction. We are the ones who are to do this. And we're going to find out that because Israel did not keep themselves from the cursed thing, once there was sin in the camp, then destruction came to the entire camp of Israel because of this. This is the warning, but next week we will find the remedy because the Almighty is still among his people. And when the standard of righteousness is upheld by those who judge according to the word, by the Levites, when that is done, then righteousness prevails and exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We will find out where we are on this course in the coming episodes. I would like to pray. Yahovah bless you and keep you. Yahovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace. Amen. <laughs>